Hi, I'm Reverend Cooper from Community Presbyterian Church, and today we are continuing our book study of Reverend Dr. Lauren Winner's Mudhouse Sabbath, an invitation to a life of spiritual discipline. And today we're covering chapters eight and nine. Chapter eight talks about aging. And um, she begins by talking about uh, her entry into a bookstore looking for a section on aging and finding really only um, beauty tricks to defy the effects of aging and then uses that setup to then talk about how um, Judaism challenges cultural concepts of aging in that uh, our cultural milieu now suggests that aging is a bad thing and that we ought to combat signs of aging with all our time, energy, and money, whereas um, Judaism and uh, the Hebrew Bible see aging as an honorable um, chapter of life, one that needs to be revered and respected. So she sets up that tension um, and uh, cites Bible verses in um, Deuteronomy and Leviticus and um, then she goes on to talk about her aging mother and um, aging uh, folks that are her elders and how caring for those elders is an obligation she feels called to live out. And um, she says... On page 97, I do not look after mom because it is consistently easy and delightful. I do it because I am obligated. And then in one of her best sentences in the whole book, she says, Most good and holy work is sometimes tedious, but these tasks are burning away our old selves and ushering in the persons God has created us to be. Which is to say... Caring for your elders is um, a holy duty. And um, then she goes on to talk about aging in its own right, not just the care for elders, but the act of aging, which she calls on some rabbis who refer to that as eldering or to sage, which I personally love. And um, she talks about how it is... Um, uh, contra the notion that there is physical decline from a religious perspective. It's a time of spiritual incline. So physical decline, spiritual incline. It kind of goes the opposite way. And um, she talks about uh, all kinds of interesting things. The most um, interesting to me is the etymological connection between the Hebrew word of gray and repentance, wherein she links the two, saying that the process of aging then is the process of setting wrong things right. Um, although I don't know the uh, scholarly response to... Um, the connection between those two words, then uh, having that level of impact on the process of aging, um, I think that that's a connection she's drawing separately. It is fair to say that there's definitely something interesting going on in um, the root for gray being linked to repentance. Uh, quite interesting, and there's so much of that kind of overlap in... Um, etymology in the Hebrew language. There's lots of terms that are derivative of one another that then have theological meaning and it is um, infinitely interesting to Hebrew nerds like myself. Um, 
Then she shifts into discussion about uh, the, the need for and the importance of community in the aging process and um, how one Jewish community uh, did so quite well and how we as Christians can claim that identity through our um, participation in the church, in our membership um, to churches, and uh, that can sort of be our Christian community that helps us to claim our own identity um, as we age and lose some sense of it through memory loss. That community creates um, a sort of uh, tribal knowledge about who you are and whose you are that you can rely on when your own memory fails. Um, and although she offers that, she kind of just dangles that out there and doesn't fully develop how we are to engage in that community as we age. Um, she just talks about the benefits of community within aging. So I think that's, um, you know, part of her her thesis in this chapter is that she's trying to assert that we are as Christians a resurrection people and that um, part of what we do when we age is we live into that identity uh, not just as we experience spiritual incline but when we have physical decline with things like our memory um, others claimed as part of that communal identity, as, as part of that resurrection body, that corporate body being the church, are um, integral to our process of aging by being the church for us, um, being that identity of a resurrection people for us when we are not able to. So she's suggesting that, although not completely articulating it. Um, my response to her is uh, a few things. First of all, I think she's suggesting a twofold discipline. Um, you know, each chapter hints at a spiritual discipline, and this one is actually kind of two disciplines in one. One would be um, the act of aging personally, and then the other, the second discipline, is. Uh, the act of caring for the elderly. And she doesn't draw a sharp distinction between the two, but she does distinguish between them. And um, I, I would personally find it more helpful if, if they were talked about separately. Um, but that said, that's how I'll, refra I'll frame some of my response in saying that, um, you know, I think that what she's doing when she comments on aging and the process of living into that on your own um, or doing so as a part of a, a Christian community, um, ideally, um, what she's doing is she is giving less of a how-to um, description of how that discipline gets lived into, but she's inviting us to see this chapter of life as a spiritual discipline. So as we've talked about in other uh, chapters that we've studied, instead of giving us a prescriptive delineation of how to enter into a specific spiritual discipline. She's hinting at things and creating and offering an invitation to view something um, that we might not have thought of before as um, a way to consider spirituality differently. And I think it goes to her title through and through an invitation to a life of spiritual discipline. She's inviting us to see this as um, a spiritual experience. So 
There's the invitation of aging. I really like her terms, eldering and to sage. Uh, and then as far as the other discipline of caring for elders, um, I'd said that I thought it was one of her best lines in the book where she talks about um, the holy work in doing something that you don't want to do uh, on page 97, but um, is important. Uh, these tasks are burning away our old selves and ushering in the persons God has created us to be. Here I think she's playing with a an incredibly important topic when you talk about spiritual discipline or discipline of any any kind um, in that uh, I think oftentimes things like prayer and um, uh, keeping Sabbath as she uh, writes about in her first chapter, and in this instance, caring for the elderly, those practices are not things that we always do because we have the strong desire to. We do them because we know they're good for us. It's much akin to exercise and dieting in that sense. Um, I don't think that everybody wants to exercise and diet every day, uh, so it doesn't always stem from desire that those things are done. It often and more often than not stems from the fact that you know it's good for you and um, the results will be more beneficial than the process. Um, and so, um, you know, this is something that personally when I engage the idea of a spiritual discipline or I'm being invited into a spiritual discipline. I struggle with that and am curious how theologians and um, authors like Dr. Winner would respond to a fuller explanation of how to overcome the challenge of um, a desireless call to discipline. How do you enter into something that you don't want to do? And is that something you need to listen to and choose to ignore certain disciplines in favor of things that you may be excited about? Are there times when you need to be more self-disciplined in order to live into your best uh, faith-filled life um, and and that for me is is a perennial question that comes with a life of spiritual discipline one that I don't think is the project of her book to answer but um, she certainly stirs up those questions and and in this chapter um, answers it in some regard by saying that there's some um, there's some level of discipline that must be applied, self-discipline, if you want to live into a fuller life, which then lends itself to a further discussion on the issue of sanctification. I won't get into that deeply here, but I did hint at this earlier on in a uh, discussion about her book, wherein um, part of the theological underpinning underpinnings of a life of spiritual discipline from a Christian perspective is the notion of sanctification. And um, basically what it means is how can we better grow in our own sanctity um, in our own sacredness of being by living a more holy life, a, a more righteous, a more um, God-centered life. And so um, with that in mind, I think uh, much of her book assumes that sanctification is an important concept in living into a fuller Christian life and that that requires discipline. And um, she says as much on 
page 97 with that quote. And so that's definitely food for thought for um, some some Christian thinkers uh, who have a tendency to emphasize justification alone um, and look more towards the grace that offers us freedom to live into our Christianity in an unbinding way, in a way that offers unending forgiveness and love and doesn't necessarily require any kind of perfection of us. That's put in tension with this idea of sanctification. So I think for Presbyterians in particular, the highest point of tension becomes less about uh, sanctification being an important concept because I think that's that's fair. It's mostly understood to be an important piece of our Christian lives. But how to live into that without feeling the need to rise to some kind of perfectionistic model or image or way of being. And um, that just comes from a lot of experience in dealing with my Presby folks. So those are my thoughts on her eighth chapter. We will dive into chapter nine. Dr. Winner's chapter on candle lighting takes up a very unique uh, perspective in her book. Um, she is taking something that is understood to be part of sacred ritual in Judaism and to some degree um, in Christianity and looking at it as a spiritual discipline. And uh, she talks about the way in which um, candle lighting marks the Sabbath and um, then shares her story from college about um, the laying of wicks and her attempt to do that with her uh, friend from college. And um, then she, she compares these rituals with the Christian use of candle lighting, um, both in the season of Advent with Advent wreaths and then with the, the lighting of the Paschal Candle, which is supposed to happen at the end of the Easter Vigil. That is a, an ancient ritual, um, and it is one that is sometimes uh, enjoyed by the Presbyterian Church, but it's not overly um, common. So it's not something that you you may be familiar with. The Great Vigil of Easter is in liturgical books. It's something I get excited about as a pastor, um, and you may have had experience with it in a different denomination um, that's maybe a little bit higher church and maybe in a Presbyterian church, but it's not often a Presbyterian ritual. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, not knowing an incredible amount about how we as Christians, um, we view sacred rituals as sacraments. I don't know what the corollary is in Judaism. Um, that being said, though, it is very interesting to me that she marks this as a spiritual practice. I don't know if it would rank high as something like a sacrament, like what we would call um, sacramental in Christianity. My guess is that it is more of a spiritual practice than something on par with a sacrament. Um, that being said, my response to this chapter is unique in that uh, she offers something interesting here because it's again an invitation to consider something um, ordinary as extraordinary, as an invitation to focus on God um, in ways that we may not have thought we could experience um, God before. However, 
my first thought is, um, what is the actual theological link between lighting a candle and experiencing our Christian God? And the link that she offers is Jesus is known to be the light of the world. So when we light this candle, we are acknowledging Christ as our light. And that has some theological structure to it. For my taste, not enough. Um, I do enjoy lighting candles. I like to do it. You'll see me do it in worship. You will see me do it in meetings. And I have a lot of candles in my office, personally, because I find them comforting and um, as a way of ushering in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit descended upon us in the form of fire at, uh, sorry, um, on Pentecost. And um, that said, though, that's not how she's framing it. Um, and so for me, there's not a, enough of a robust theological explanation as to why this would be considered um, a Christian discipline that we ought to take up. Um, I, I'm left with more questions than I am answers after reading this. Um, and so part of the reason I'm taking issue with it is that um, there's, there's a way in which we can sacralize the ordinary. In other words, to make that which we have not formerly seen as a sacred enterprise or action become more holy. And um, there are lots of ways that we can do this as Christians. And we've talked about that in her other chapters when we talked about intention and setting godly intentions around what you're doing, be it um, observing time with God in prayer, in Sabbath rest, or in eating certain foods. Um, I do wonder though, if the practice of lighting a candle is um, actually desacralizing uh, Christian theology, um, just by virtue of the fact that it's not necessarily um, taking a practice and infusing it with uh, more spirituality, it seems to be sort of the, the reverse. It's taking a practice that you enjoy and trying to justify it as um, somehow theologically participating in the life of the church. And so for me, there's an issue of order here. Um, it's misordered. And um, I do think that there's rationale for it to be properly ordered. Um, but that that's missing for me in, in this chapter. And so um, my personal response to this is, Okay, I like lighting candles, but that to me seems like less of a spiritual discipline than it might be something that could be in addition to times of prayer that remind you that Jesus is the light of the world or that, um, uh, you know, we carry that fire of the Holy Spirit within us, even in still small, quiet spaces like when and where we light a candle, um, but I think there's some, some sacralization of the ordinary that um, doesn't have to take place here. Uh, there needs to be some more ro robust theological argument for this to be considered a discipline that we'd want to take up um, with such intention. And so I think it's... It's an interesting chapter. It's one that I um, I question, and my questioning then opens me up to you all thinking, I'm so curious what chapters have done the same for you. Um, as you've been reading, have there been ones that you've thought chapters or spiritual disciplines where you've thought, what is she talking about? And this seems like nonsense. Or on the 
on the other side of the spectrum, have there been ones that have just spoken volumes to you? And so if you are participating in this book study and you'd like to respond to me, I really welcome your sharing with me what chapters so far have been um, igniting the fire and what have been just causing more questions. Um, so with that, I, I will leave you uh, to please engage me with your responses and to go ahead and finish out chapters 10 and 11 for next week, which will be the ending portion of our little book study. Thank you for your time today as in other days and peace be with you.